<laughs> Let's face it. Liberals are offended by everything. Right on. And they have zero sense of humor. Right on. Huh? Right on. It's the party game that pokes fun at political correctness and liberalism run amok. But making fun of them is hilarious for the rest of us. So play right on and mock the progressive left and their fake news media counterparts in a variety of categories, such as race hustle, (laughs) the wussification of America, earth snobs, Islam abomination, Hollywood hypocrites, and campus coddling. Feminism. Feminism follies and rainbow games, and don't forget, millennial <laughs> entitlement and many others. Right on, created by conservatives for conservatives. Because mocking the left feels so right on. Give the gift of <laughs> all year long by going to rightongame.com. That's rightongame.com. Use promo code MOJO50 for a 10% discount. That's rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. And while you're there, check out the new drinking game option. Warning, microaggressions contained in this box. Millennials and snowflakes will be offended by its contents. Retreating to safe spaces are highly recommended. Rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. (laughs) Rightongame.com. the truth the denise simon experience the truth matrix vetting exposing drilling down to the truth rolling thunder this is hitman seattle hitman this is rolling thunder seattle the denise simon experience exposing politics lies demagoguery spin fraud Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to Mark. Mike Charlie, 473-9er, 89er, out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark Smoke on the deck, two rounds, AGPT, gas, TOT, 53. Simon Experience. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Denise Simon Experience. Um, one particular uh, activity uh, happened last weekend where uh, President Trump signed a, an executive order removing a United States signature from a UN arms trade treaty. Um, it was a flash in the, in the news and then it kind of went away. Um, and so what did I do? Well, I trotted on over to uh, my favorite organization, the Heritage Foundation, and um, Ted Broman picked the short straw to be with us to discuss the implications of um, the removal of our signature to uh, this treaty. And um, Ted is the uh, Anglo-American relations, U.S. relations with Europe and the EU and uh, U.S. leadership in the world for the Heritage Foundation. So with that, um, Ted, thanks for being with us. Great to be with you. Thank you. Um, this treaty is really, uh, from what I can tell, it's a treaty, but uh, the United States really never ratified it. Did I get that right? That is correct, although the... Most people believe out there, unfortunately, that uh, if the U.S. doesn't ratify a treaty, it doesn't matter. That is incorrect. Uh, The U.S. doctrine is and has been for a long time that when the president or the president's representative signs a treaty, that treaty becomes binding in its essence on the United States, even if the Senate doesn't act. Uh, This is known as not defeating the quote-unquote object and purpose of a treaty. So this is a huge loophole in the U.S. treaty process. It essentially allows the president to sign on to a treaty and to make it something very close to being law without the Senate ever ratifying it. Okay, so it really, in by virtue of the fact of signing executive order removing the signature, it really didn't 
it did unwind something, but then it didn't unwind something. Is that? It, yeah. It, what, what the president <laughs> signed on Friday was a request to the Senate to essentially take the treaty, put it in an envelope, and mail it back to him. Uh, he, he asked the Senate to just stop considering it. He is also writing to the United Nations, essentially sending them a great big eraser to take the U.S. signature off of this treaty. Now, I'm in favor of both of these things, but the most important one wasn't the request to the Senate. The most important thing was erasing the U.S. signature off the treaty at the United Nations. That's the really legal act. Um, now, this particular treaty, uh, we're all, you know, the little people out here in the world, including myself, um, we just felt like it had to do specifically with the Second Amendment, but it, it hardly does because it it is a much wider text in in this treaty that includes you know, tanks and airplanes, military equipment, conventional arms. Um, so it, it it may have, you know, touched somewhat of the Second Amendment, but it's a much wider um, uh, definition, correct? Oh, that's, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Sometimes folks call this the UN Small Arms Treaty, but you're absolutely right. This is everything from pistols all the way up to battleships. It's everything that is not a weapon of mass destruction. So it's not nuclear weapons, it's not chemical weapons, it's not biologic weapons, but it's shotguns, pistols, rifles, tanks, helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft, destroyers, battleships, and everything else. Why would the United States uh, even want to be a part of something like this? I mean, you know, it puts limits on ourselves and really everybody else, when in fact the United States is always kind of leading um, the globe in some kind of uh, peacekeeping military action that we would necessarily have some kind of bureaucratic ball and chain attached, right? Well, that is a very good question. If it genuinely did limit everyone, if it limited Russia and China and Iran and all the other bad actors in the world, you might say that it would be worth accepting limits on ourselves. I mean, that would at least be an argument. I'm not sure that I would, I would agree with it, but it would at least be worth discussing. The problem is, of course, that treaties like this never limit the bad actors. They only <laughs> limit the good, good actors. ones. Right. Yeah. I mean, here, the Second Amendment is comparison is sort of relevant. Um, you know, if you ban firearms, all the criminals are going to turn their guns in, right? Sure. Well, no, of course <laughs> they're not. So that's there is a little bit of a problem uh, with this. Uh, why did the U.S. get into this is, is the question you asked, and it's a good one. Basically, there was a huge campaign starting in the mid-1990s, uh, which lasted almost 20 years and finally culminated in this treaty. And the U.S. did not pay much attention to this, except occasionally to vote against it in the U.N., but the campaign continued. And when President Obama came into office, his people had to decide, do we want to try to get this treaty through the U.N.? Because there was going to be a treaty at that point. Do we want the treaty to happen in the U.N., or do we want it to happen outside the U.N.? Well, we know from past experience that it happening outside the U.N. means it would be completely crazy. Whereas it happening in the U.N. means that we would have a much bigger voice on it. So they decided to push it through the U.N. That, I think, was a defensible decision. I'm not sure I would have done it, but it, at least it's not a stupid decision. The real problem is that when the treaty was negotiated, it turned out to be a very bad treaty, and yet the Obama administration signed on to it anyhow. That was a serious mistake. Uh, if the rest of the world wants a foolhardy treaty like this, fine, let them have it. But there's no reason for us to participate. So for for the sake of argument, um, we are uh, deferring compliance um, and policing of this treaty to a United Nations committee if we stayed in it? Well, Fortunately, there is no compliance mechanism, oh. uh, which is indeed, which is one of the things that makes it a very silly treaty indeed. Uh, now, 
as a matter of practice, I'm glad there is no compliance mechanism because it would certainly be used against the United States. But most treaties have a couple of things. Uh, they have definitions. You know, they, the treaty explains what it's about. The Arms Trade Treaty has no definitions in it whatsoever. Uh, it's completely undefined. So you can have a really legitimate argument about what the heck the treaty says because the treaty doesn't make it at all clear. Uh, most treaties have some sort of consequences. You know, you could call it some kind of enforcement mechanism for breaking it. Arms Trade Treaty has absolutely none of those. Um, the Arms Trade Treaty has nothing of the sort of the traditional mechanisms of a treaty, which is one reason why I think it's simply not a very serious idea. But the broader problem is that inevitably a treaty like this is going to affect the United States, which is going to take it seriously, but it's not going to affect Russia, China, Iran, India, Pakistan, Syria, Saudi Arabia. You know, you could go on and on and on with all of the sort of dubious or bad or, or just difficult actors in the world. Why is it in our interest to accept restraints on our own ability to export arms while other powers, which are much more irresponsible and are frequently dictatorships, have no restraints put placed on them. I simply can't understand that. Well, uh, and you bring up a, a, an outstanding point. You've got rogue countries that are doing things whatever way they want to do them. Uh, Victor Boot and Adnan Khashoggi come to mind. So um, <laughs> it, it it, it was almost as though that this UN, uh, this arms treaty was a gesture and um, uh, under the, I, I guess, under the Obama administration that, that ended up really having no teeth, but a hundred other countries signed on to it. Um, do we have some kind of a panic of these other 99 or 100 countries since the United well, States has erased their signature? Panic, I think, is a little too strong. Uh, many of them won't like it very much that we've quit. I don't really care what they think, but many of them will not like it very much. Um, the, the, but if you take a look at what they actually do as opposed to what they say, uh, the results are rather revealing. Uh, there are currently 101 nations that have signed and ratified the Arms Trade Treaty. We, of course, signed but did not fully ratify uh, out of those 101, uh, a, only about 60 or so actually submit the annual reports that they're required to submit. Uh, only about 55 actually pay their bills to support the treaty's infrastructure. So the treaty is really uh, most of the nations in Europe and then a very few other players outside of Europe. Uh, very, very few. So lots of the world has signed on, but they don't submit their reports. They don't pay their bills. Uh, they do absolutely nothing in practice to comply with the treaty. So they talk a good game, but they don't do anything. And why should that be a surprise? Because the treaty has absolutely no incentives for complying with it. Put it this way. If you're a marginally democratic or maybe a marginally authoritarian government, what possible incentive do you have for signing on to a treaty which the express purpose of which is to limit your ability to import and export the means of your own defense? Yeah. So what do you have to gain out of that? You don't have anything. If, if you want to advance human rights in your country, that's very laudable. Well, in that case, how about becoming a democracy? You know, there's a start. Um, what in the world is some authoritarian government going to get out of this? They're not going to get anything, which is why they're not going to comply. You know, the treaty advocates have this idea that this would be good for people if, you know, there were fewer authoritarian regimes exporting arms around the world. Well, that's true. But you know what's going to stop them? It's not going to be a treaty. Exactly. It's it's going to be these places becoming democracies, and a treaty is not going to change that. I'm not sure what other countries, other than perhaps, you know, China, uh, Russia, I mean, some of these other signatories to this treaty are dealing in warships and, and 
battle tanks anyway. So it almost would seem to me that the the crux of the of the, the language in this treaty virtually had to do with small arms and illicit trade. Uh, so um, that was where it almost seems like the genesis of putting something like the NRA on notice. Is that overstating it? No, I don't think it is. I mean, as I said earlier, the treaty covers everything from pistols to tanks mm -hmm. and battleships. But the reality is that everyone who wanted this treaty was 99% only interested in small arms. Mm -hmm. That was really where the action was. And, you know, we saw this problem coming way down the road. Uh, myself and, and representatives of other organizations, I'm not going to say who they are, but you can probably guess, uh, went off and talked to the treaty advocates very early in 2010, 2011, 2012. And we told them explicitly, look, if you don't put something in this treaty that makes it absolutely clear that this has nothing to do with national uh, constitutional protections for the right to keep and bear firearms, this is never going to get through the Senate. Just And on the other hand, if you put that in, the odds are that the Senate will eventually ratify it. We, we told them that that explicitly. And they absolutely refuse to insert that kind of language protecting a right to keep and bear arms as you know defined by a national constitution within the arms trade treaty. Well, you know, they got what they wanted. They got a treaty that you can interpret about six ways to Sunday, mm -hmm. but which doesn't have that protection in it. And now the Senate's never going to ratify it. If they'd listened to us, they might have gotten a treaty that you could actually get through the Senate, and then I wouldn't. I would still think it was silly. I would still think it wouldn't work, but it wouldn't raise nearly the level of political opposition that it's raised. I would disagree with you just on one thing, however, oh, quickly. Cool. <laughs> uh, this is not a question of, you know, the, the word, the phrase international, the phrase illegal or illicit trade is really very hard to define mm -hmm. because the treaty is so vague. What is illegal according to the arms trade treaty? Well, it's things that are against international law. What does international law say? Well, you give me 20 international lawyers and I'll give you 20 definitions of what international <laughs> yes. law means. Yes. There is no agreement on this. So saying that trade that is illicit should be banned is a little bit like saying the U.S. should take a firm stand against crime by passing a law outlawing it. You know, if that was going to work, it wouldn't be necessary. That's the problem with talking about the illicit trade. It's all a matter of definitions. And then we, you know, we like to inject. Well, thank you for that, by the way, because I was I was being a little on the snarky side with that comment. But anyway, um, they, you know, we like to inject things like undermine international efforts to reduce human suffering. Well, <laughs> I don't even know why that would necessarily be in there, Ted. Do you? Well, it's it's the kind of vague language that. You know, could be meaningless, could be a, a nice platitude, uh, or could be interpreted in very destructive sorts of ways. Um, you know, no one denies that using weapons in war causes suffering, right? But what is the point of what is the point of the war? Uh, my simple analogy is this: uh, when a murderer shoots a cop, uh, we call that a cop killing. When a cop shoots a murderer, uh, in the course of committing another murderer, um, we call that a laudable action. We, pull it, we, pray, we praise the policeman for doing it. Now, the question is not, is there suffering? The question is not, are there weapons being used? The question is, to what ends are the weapons being used, and are those ends right or wrong? When the British bombed Germany in World War II, that was laudable and praiseworthy. When the Nazis bombed London, that was wrong. It was they were both bombing, but one was acting in the right and one was acting for evil. So you can't just look at human suffering and say human suffering is a problem. No. <laughs> War is about imposing your will through force on the enemy and that involves inflicting a level of suffering. You shouldn't do that gratuitously, but if it is done in the right, 
Well, stopping it is essentially giving the bad guys a free pass. Why is that a good thing? And this uh, treaty didn't really have any effect on things like man pads, shoulder fired missile stingers, uh, kind of making their way to all kinds of uh, questionable locations. Um, it, it, you know, the United States is not involved in that, but um, it, those kinds of things were still going on. So the, the rogueness of transfers of small arms, including tanks and I don't know how, uh, you know, fighter jets can be small arms, but those things were still going on anyway. So um, this treaty oh, didn't, they were. yeah, <laughs> so we really didn't gain anything, did we, Ted? No, and it's it's not possible that a treaty like this is going to stop rogues from being rogues in precisely the same way that passing a law against you know murder is going to stop people from murdering. You know, it, I wish it worked that way, right? I mean, I wish we could just ban all evil by passing a law sure. against it. Or morality, yeah. yeah. I mean, unfortunately. You can't just pass laws. You also have to have actual enforcement. And, you know, this treaty has no enforcement provisions. Now, I'm very grateful for that as a matter of practice, because given what the treaty advocates say, it would, these enforcement provisions would be used against the United States. You want an example of this? Here's, here's a nice little one of the way they think. Uh, the, the lead non-governmental organization behind the Arms Trade Treaty is a group called Control Arms. On Sunday, they put out uh, a, one of their little daily sort of, you know, collections of stories that they thought were important on the arms trade treaty. Their lead story on Sunday was a story saying President Trump's decision to unsign ATT will be a political catastrophe. You know where that story came from? Press TV, the Iranian regime. Oh, and cool. <laughs> they they quoted it as coming from press TV, and the guy that they quoted, I'm not going to use his name because he doesn't deserve any publicity, is a known supporter of Putin and the Iranian government. And Gee. that was that was their lead story on Sunday, and their lead critic of President Trump was an agent of the Russian and the Iranian regime taken direct from Iranian propaganda television. Now, either maybe they didn't know what press TV is, sure. or maybe they didn't care. In any case, they're fools. And I'm that's a, the kind I'm of a, thing <laughs> that they do all the time. I'm a burned out tennis player, and I know what press TV is. Um, big applause to you, uh, Mr. Ted Broman, um, for explaining all this. Uh, there's been some panics out here that... Uh, needed your presentation so thank you for your time and, um, and your insight into this and ladies and gentlemen there's more coming your way so stay with us this is don newen with cowboy logic radio and i carry my sig sour nine millimeter every day it's like a MasterCard. I never leave home without it. And I'm glad you do, given that you work in Atlanta every day, talking about a rough place to work. Well, Donna, I would say that most of our beloved Cowboy Logic Radio listeners not only own, but carry their weapons, too. It's just the thing to do nowadays. So do I, Don. And we need to share with our listeners a fantastic weapons company, Tar River Arms. Oh, and I should mention, they were founded by United States Marine. Enough said, right? Bad assomatic. TarRiverArms.com. That's T-A-R RiverArms.com. Tar River Arms, America's first virtual gun store, makes it easier and more comfortable than ever to purchase your firearm online. And through 3D interactive experiences, you can even view and inspect that gun you're purchasing. They even have weekly specials that eliminate shipping and broker fees, Donna. Great guns, great prices, and great service. And remember... Tar River Arms is veteran-owned and operated. Don, would you expect anything less from a Marine? No, ma'am. At TarRiverArms.com, you can search by caliber, manufacturer, and firearm types. Revolvers, semi-automatic pistols, including your SIG, Don. Short barrel rifles, long rifles, shotguns, and NFA silencers. 
They even have very hard to find products such as the H and K MP5. Totally badass. Tar River Arms have some of the coolest high end tactical weapons made, all at great prices. TarRiverArms.com, U.S. Marine owned and operated. Hoorah! Hoorah! Hey, gang, did you know that the big cellular companies fund liberal causes and candidates, not Patriot Mobile? You're correct, Donna. Did you know that the big mobile companies have spent over $100 million to elect liberal candidates? They also fund liberal causes, agendas, and organizations such as Planned Parenthood, not Patriot Mobile. Here's how it works. You, our beloved Cowboy Logic Radio listeners, pay your cell phone bill every month. Then, Big Mobile takes your money and gives millions to liberal candidates who authorize subsidies to provide free cell service, Obama phones, to do nothings who vote for more liberals so they can keep getting more free stuff that you pay for, not Patriot Mobile. So here's how you fight back. Switch to Patriot Mobile with unlimited plans starting as low as 20 bucks a month and stop funding the big cellular companies. Feel good about funding the right agendas. Every dollar you spend makes a statement. What message are you sending? And it's easy to switch. You can even keep your same number, and they've got great nationwide coverage that includes Double D Ranch. Visit them online at PatriotMobile.com or call them at 1-800-A-PATRIOT. And for any of the guilt-ridden liberals, that's 1-800-272-8746. Created by conservatives for conservatives. Their name says it all. Patriot Mobile. Do it now. PatriotMobile.com or 1-800-A-PATRIOT. Ladies and gentlemen, what message are you sending? Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us on the Denise Simon Experience. We've got chaos. I mean, I I don't even know if chaos is the right word anymore. When it comes to, I think we've crossed the Rubicon at the southern border here. Um, At least that's what we're certainly being told by Border Patrol. So um, my dear buddy over there at FAIR, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, Matt O'Brien, a previous guest and a stellar one at that has been kind enough to join us to talk about um, th- the fact that not only are we overwhelmed, but it's kind of like, what are we doing now? I mean, what what is what does six months from now look like? Um, because I'm not seeing any kind of legislation or proposals. So welcome, Mr. Matt. And are you seeing any kind of um, proposals legislatively? Thank you. Um, <coughs> you know, it's kind of strange because we're hearing all kinds of information about a uh, resurrection of the RAISE Act, which is a a favorable uh, proposal that would help correct some of these problems and limit some of the legal migration, as well as eliminating some of the unlawful migration. We have, of course, Mr. Kushner's much vaunted proposal, which bits and pieces have been coming out, and that looks like it's just the type of amnesty that we've all been trying to avoid. Uh, The Democrats say that they're working on a comprehensive immigration reform plan, which of course is just the code word for another giant amnesty. And meanwhile, from a practical standpoint, the Flores agreement and a lot of the silly disconnects that are in the asylum statute are just making the situation at the southern border worse. And then in addition, you have uh, a lot of stuff going around the Internet about the fact that the drug cartels now seem to be on public radio stations throughout the Northern Triangle in Central America advertising their smuggling services like they were advertising for an airline. So it's uh, business as usual with immigration. (laughs) The the matter of running ads, though, is not a new phenomenon. I think that it was just kind of it resurfaced because of Maria Bartiromo uh, went down there to the border and the Border Patrol agent just happened to mention that they were running ads. But when, you know, these smugglers are charging anywhere from 2000 to eleven or 12000 to bring, you know, one or two or a group north, um, that enterprise is allegedly around a $2 billion enterprise. Um, so they can afford to run TV ads, correct? 
Uh, yeah, I think it, it's, uh, you're 100% correct. They've been running ads for ages. Most of the time it was done on sort of the Central American equivalent of uh, Craigslist or Backpage right, or done right. in, uh, in local, uh, the classified sections of, of local print outlets. But um, this seems to be the first instance of uh, this sort of blatant radio and TV thing, although that's not shocking because if I recall correctly, sometime in the late 80s or the early 90s, uh, one of the drug cartels in Mexico had its own radio station. Um, so it's, um, you know, we're, we're entering a new age where a lot of things that were considered illicit are now sort of being mainstreamed um, both here and in the United States. And uh, in Latin America, it seems to have opened up a significant amount of business opportunity for the cartels because they can use the same routes that they use to smuggle drugs, to smuggle people, uh, and then scarier things like smuggling terrorists or guns or bombs or things of that nature. Um, one thing that's particularly significant that I haven't seen anybody really speak to enough is that um, Shanahan, uh, Department of Defense Secretary in in uh, acting capacity approved another 320 military to go down to you know some part of the border um and they're up there in a certainly in a support role and that's good because what is happening is the border patrol has been taken out of enforcing law and national security and public safety situations to a humanitarian condition and I believe that somebody ought to be sounding a major alarm on that right about now. Um, you know, the Border Patrol has been kind of the uh, Florence Nightingale Uber drivers for a while, but now because of the volume, that's gotten much worse. Um, and I, I can't even begin to imagine what any kind of proposed legislation can ever come about that could even begin to fix that because of the volume. Is that right, Matt? Uh, yeah, a couple of observations. So first off, um, the Border Patrol's function is to guard the border. So taking these people who have been trained as law enforcement professionals and who do dangerous, tough policing work along the border day in and day out and asking them to do these types of tasks is ridiculous. It's not an effective use of resources. We have entities within the U.S. government like FEMA and the United States Public Health Service that could be more effectively deployed yes, to deal with thank these you. things. And I'm not quite sure why President Trump, who quite frankly just has not been uh, shy about upsetting the apple cart, has not done just that. Now, the other observation that I would make is when President Trump did first deploy troops to the border, you had a whole bunch of squawking and hysteria about the Posse Comitatus Act. Mm -hmm. um, that was monumentally hypocritical for a couple of reasons. The first one is that President Obama sent troops to the border to act in a support role, as have a number of other presidents. Uh, but on top of that, at the time that the Posse Comitatus Act was passed, it, it border control was not considered a law enforcement activity. It was handled by the Army. Uh, and several times since the passage of the Posse Comitatus Act, the most noticeable being when uh, General Jack Pershing uh, took a significant component of the U.S. Army to the border to repulse incursions by Pancho Villa's band of bandits yes. and subsequently political revolutionaries under the control of Pancho Villa. And that was not the only time that we've used the military to control the border. So I'm not sure why everyone is dancing on hot coals about effectively using the military to police the border. There seems to be this mistaken notion among the the folks on the left that it's perfectly okay to use the United States military to project force outward, but it's somehow defending our territory, which is the purpose of a sovereign nation's armed forces, creates some kind of big constitutional legal problem. And that's just not legally, historically, or even logically accurate. Well, I mean, you use the word sovereign territory. We use the military to protect our sovereign territory wherever they are across the globe. I mean, uh, we've got diplomatic posts and embassies and those kinds of things. I mean, they're protecting sovereign territory. So it's kind of like, what's the difference, correct? Correct. And, and there isn't any difference. And frankly, if you applied the logic that the left is applying in this case, 
and and extended it to its its logical conclusion, their argument would basically say that the next time there's a Pearl Harbor, we can't repulse the foreign enemy when they attack us, which is just an absurd notion. And this, even though it's not organized, well, arguably not organized by a foreign government, frankly, I, I think there is government influence um, by places as diverse as you know, Cuba, Russia, uh, I do China, too. Um, on these movements in Latin America. But the fact is, you know, there is an argument that these are just people coming. So it's not a military invasion, but nonetheless, it is a mass incursion of citizens of a foreign nation into the United States, which meets the legal definition of an invasion. And we have a right as a sovereign nation to say to these people, hey, listen, we're more than happy to consider whether you have an international law right to be protected, but you don't get to just come in here because that's what you want. And the way the situation is working out because of ridiculous Ninth Circuit holdings and this sort of crazy left-leaning global internationalist notion that somehow borders are silly and we should erase them, is that we're not sending a clear message to any of these folks that, listen, this is the line where the United States starts. You want to come over that line, you do things the way we tell you to do them, that's how this works. And and we're failing miserably right now at communicating that message to the rest of the world. And the sad part is there's recent historical examples of how that works out because Europe was dealing with the exact same kind of crisis, you know, in 2015, 2016, and mm-hmm. 2017. Which caused Brexit. Which caused Brexit, which has caused all kinds of crazy problems. They're having outbreaks of diseases that were eliminated 50 years ago in Germany. Uh, They've had a spike in crime in Germany and Sweden. Um, You just cannot, without a plan, inject millions of people from a foreign country and a foreign culture who don't have any job skills, who don't have any plan to integrate themselves into the society where the government doesn't have any plan to integrate them into the society and then expect somehow that everything is going to turn out right. And I think when people compare this to Ellis Island, the way the immigration system worked then is you had to have a relative who's willing to sponsor you financially and have a job offer or a marketable job skill before you ever got on the boat from the old country. And since integration and assimilation weren't discouraged back then, what you had is each little ethnic community became its own pipeline into the American system. And so you had people who had arrived ahead of time encouraging the newcomers to learn the language, to become familiar with the legal system, to become familiar with social customs. What you have now is people who seem to think that uh, you are entitled to relocate wherever you want in the world and take your culture and all the customs of your country and the legal system of your country and wholesale import them into wherever it is you're going. And that inevitably will create problems beyond just the logistical nightmare that we have going on on the border right now. Um, The Trump administration has made some proposals in the last few hours, if you will, to kind of uh, add some regulations slash restrictions to the asylum laws um, and to the process, uh, least of which would be, you, you know, it's going to cost you a fee to apply. You cannot have a job here while your case is being, um, you know, legally examined and, um, you know, a few, a few other items. Um, I haven't seen a panic yet on that, but I, I have a feeling one's going to show up here. <laughs> Uh, Matt, where where did our uh, we we haven't rewritten the asylum laws forever? I mean, where did they where did our asylum law really come from? Well, the asylum law is the the U.S. application of the 1951 uh, UN Convention on the Status of Refugees, uh, which had a 1967 update. Uh, the way treaties work in the United States is in order for them to be effective, the president signs them, they have to be ratified by the Senate, and then the whole Congress passes implementing legislation which indicates how the treaty will be handled under U.S. law. So the asylum rules were really written by the U.N. for a European population that was displaced following the Second World War. 
And because of that, they were very well adapted to the Cold War, but they don't reflect current realities and they don't reflect the patterns of movement that are typical now. You had people from Eastern Europe moving into Germany. You had people from Italy and Greece, which had failed economies after the Second World War, moving uh, to places like uh, France, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Um, those were people mainly moving to countries that were similar to them in terms of uh, social customs, religion, notions of civic duty. So the, the UN regulations do not reflect the way migration works in the age of the superjet and the internet and worldwide travel. Um, we have updated them on occasion, the 96 Act, some 2000 changes. So here and there, we, we have made updates. The asylum laws were updated, I think it was via the 96 Act, to require that your case be pending before either USCIS or the Immigration Court for 180 days before you could get work. You couldn't uh, come in the U.S., be here illegally for 20 years, and then apply for asylum if you entered the U.S., unlawfully and we're going to seek asylum, you had to do it within one year. Um, so we've adjusted these things, but we haven't adjusted them effectively. And I, I think as far as the suggestions by the Trump administration, I have a, a, a question and a couple of observations. My, my question is, why didn't the Trump administration do this when it had control of both houses of Congress? Um, I realize we question. <laughs> well, and I realize we that probably is a harsh question since we weren't in the midst of quite this level of crisis at the time. But nonetheless, um, the writing was on the wall that things could uh, change with the midterm elections, and so I think these things probably should have been pursued by the Republican Party. And then, you know, as far as observations, a lot of these things that are being suggested are great, but the Trump administration seems to suffer from one of the same problems that the Obama administration suffered from. Most of these changes that they're talking about are things that need to be done by Congress passing legislation rather than by executive order or by amending the Code of Federal Regulations. And I think that the Trump administration overall needs to do better researching these things and then coming out with a plan of action. What would really do a lot to eliminate these problems would be, number one, to go back to court and petition for an amendment of the Flores Agreement. Uh, Ms. Flores is no longer a minor. She is no longer subject to detention. Uh, so you have a settlement agreement which is tied to a specific case when the Ninth Circuit doesn't have any jurisdiction to hear any of those cases or controversies associated with those issues uh, anymore because the plaintiffs are all over age. Uh, so why that thing is hanging around creating problems, I don't know. Uh, then over and above that, the president got much more of a slam dunk than anybody realized with the Supreme Court decision in Trump v. Hawaii, because the Supreme Court blatantly said that Section 1182F of the Immigration and Nationality Act was a emergency provision that allowed the president in extreme circumstances to impose requirements on aliens seeking admission to the United States that are above and beyond those that are currently specified in the Immigration and Nationality Act. Now, the other side swore up and down that wasn't the case, but the Supreme Court couldn't have been any more explicit in that. So I think what the president should be doing is putting out a proclamation invoking 1182F and saying, listen, until further notice, this is how I'm running the border. And I said this to you before, I'll say it again. The most effective thing the president could do is say, listen, this type of relief is still available, but you need to seek refugee status in an embassy or consulate closer to home. You can't have asylum because we've been seeing too many bogus claims being pursued by people from these countries who in reality are economic migrants, not asylum seekers. Goodness. Um, and, and so what kind of memos is FAIR sending over to this White House <laughs> to say, um, here's some arrows for your quiver here, um, such that he can uh, either, one, go back to a court with a case and or um, apply an executive order reestablishing existing law? Um. Well, he's done a very good job at uh, issuing executive orders that have said, hey, this stuff that these prior administrations were doing 
uh, was not acceptable. It's not how the law was written. Uh, the problem he has is that every time he does that, the ACLU, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the National Lawyers Guild file a suit in the Ninth Circuit, mm-hmm. and some whacked out cockamamie anarchist that's sitting on the bench in the Ninth Circuit says, yeah, I don't like this. It it, it doesn't uh, line up with my personal Birkenstock wearing views, and I'm going to issue a nationwide injunction out of the district court and say that the president doesn't have the authority to do this. And the problem is for that stuff to percolate its way up to the Supreme Court takes you know anywhere Forever. from 18 months, like Trump v. Hawaii did, which was actually fairly quick, to, you know, five, six years. And in the meantime, the government has to work around all of these issues. So the first thing the president should probably be doing, the most significant, is contesting this whole notion that federal district courts have any authority to issue nationwide injunctions. And in his concurring opinion in Trump v. Hawaii, Uh, Clarence Thomas basically laid out the legal case with citations and everything that the Justice Department should be pursuing in doing that. Why the Trump administration has has not done that, I don't know. We certainly are advocating all the things that I talk about with you on a regular basis. We have communicated not just to the White House, but to legislators up on the Hill uh, as well. Um, I think the message gets through, but I think there is so much background interference to everything that President Trump is trying to do that he is really having a tough job doing things that other presidents would have been allowed to do without question. I mean, if you look at President Obama, he shrink-wrapped several billion dollars worth of foreign cash and shipped it on jumbo jets to the Iranians in pursuit of this ridiculous nuclear deal that looked like it had been written by the most immoral used car dealers that you could possibly find. Um, And nobody questioned any of that in a court. And I don't think it occurred to anybody on in the Republican Party on the right side of these issues to go to the court and contest it. But everything that President Trump does somehow becomes quite literally a federal case. And it's it's a, a deliberate abuse of the court system in order to hobble his activities as a president. It's really unconscionable. Kind of death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, so you you mentioned the Rays Act with uh, I think that was um, authored by Senator Tom Cotton. Is that right? Uh, it was. Uh, I want to say Cotton Grassley and one other who is escaping me right now. Uh, maybe Purdue. So, it, 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 when a when a piece of legislation, I mean, there was quite the um, discussion about that a uh, year and a half or so ago. Um, is that kind of a piece of legislation that just kind of sits there until, um, y- you know, somebody decides that they want to have an immigration discussion, or, um, c- you know, can it be? Uh, reintroduced um, with, you know, a scarlet letter attached to the Democrats? Um, I think it can be reintroduced. The question is how effectively, because so many of the Democrats don't like this, but that's not really the problem. The problem is that many of the centrist Republicans who have built a career on being big business um, and, you know, who are sort of um, in the sway of the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce see the Reyes Act as somehow interfering with the ability of companies, particularly in the tech industry, to recruit foreign labor when they need it. Now, the reality is that the Reyes Act would not do that by switching to a merit-based immigration system that ties recruiting for foreign labor to the needs of the U.S. economy. It would do several things. Um, The first is any of those key industries that would actually make more visas available and make it easier to to get true talent into the United States. The second thing that it would do is by ensuring that employers aren't doing the type of things that, say, Disney did with the H-1Bs and simply Mm -hmm. replacing expensive domestic workers with cheaper foreign workers – it would allow the wage market in the tech industry to reset itself. And I think you'd find 
many people in the U.S. who were forced out of the tech industry going back to it, and I think you would find more young people attracted to that industry because they wouldn't be competing with cheap foreign labor to get entry-level jobs. Um, it's a great piece of legislation. It just remains to be seen how many of the mainstream centrist Republicans can be convinced to vote for it. And you know, quite honestly, it's something that should appeal to many of the uh, economics and business-oriented Democrats and probably would have prior to the Trump administration where the Democratic Party seems to have taken this um, a step to the left that places many of their supposedly mainstream people on this sort of socialist anarchist continuum. So we're having discussions now um, between uh, the House and the Senate and the White House on infrastructure, which tells me that uh, any kind of advancement on immigration reform is dead. It, it's just not going to go anywhere for two years. Is that overstating it? Uh, I think it might be because I think you know President Trump has a a lack on his team of people who are adept at navigating the way mm -hmm. things are done in D.C. and he seems to have a shortage of people who are able to give him clear cut advice on how constitutional legal issues work. On the other hand, his team seems to be very adept at sort of circumventing some of the conflict and giving the other side opportunities to either put up or shut up. Right. And when I was listening to the news coverage this morning, I was wondering if the infrastructure discussions were designed to either allow the Democrats to make some headway on some legislation and maybe thereby soften them up a little bit. On yeah, the I was thinking the same thing. And make them willing to negotiate somewhat. Um, or if they fail to do that, give the or some kind of a bargaining chip, uh, a bargaining chip, but also give him an opportunity if they won't come forward and do this, the president to be able to point his fingers and say, listen, Chuck and Nancy aren't serious about anything. They're right. playing the hate Trump game at the expense of the American voter. I have tried. I went forward with a good immigration deal to give a DACA amnesty. We didn't like the DACA amnesty part of it, but the other parts of it were pretty good. They rejected that. Now I've oh. done the same thing with infrastructure, and they've kicked that out, too. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Matt O'Brien at FAIR, F-A-I-R, Federation for American Immigration Reform. Thank you, Mr. Matt. And um, ladies Thank and gentlemen, you, there's, more coming, there's more coming your way, so stay with us. Hey, Donna, Cowboy Logic Radio listeners love law enforcement. That's right, Don. And Charity Magnets designs and produces beautiful, high-quality products for law enforcement supporters and enthusiasts. They've got very impressive honor badge car magnets. CharityMagnets.com. They've got license plate honor badges. CharityMagnets.com. They've got cool keychains and license plate frames. CharityMagnets.com. I'm on their website right now, and this is my favorite, the honor badge dog tag. Look at that little doggy with the dog tag. He's so cute. Donna. We're trying to do an ad read, and you're playing around on their website, which happens to be CharityMagnets.com. But he's so cute. Donna. Okay. Hey, this is huge, too. For each sale, a donation will be made to Cops for Kids with Cancer. Cops for Kids with Cancer has given more than $2.5 million in donations. Yes. Become a Blue Honor Foundation member today. Like Donna is doing right now, go to CharityMagnets.com. But he's so cute. All right, use the promo code MOJO for five bucks off any purchase. I know you all love and support our brave law enforcement professionals and their families. Show your support today by going to CharityMagnets.com and check out that little puppy. He's so cute. Hey, Don, can we go to the pound and get another rescue dog, please? please? No, Donna, no. Five rescue dogs are enough, but I'm going to CharityMagnets.com, and I'm making some purchases right now. Become a Blue Honor Foundation member today. Enter Mojo at checkout and get $5 off. CharityMagnets.com. <laughs> Let's face it. Liberals are offended by everything. Right on. And they have zero sense of humor. Right on. Huh? 
Right on. It's the party game that pokes fun at political correctness and liberalism run amok. But making fun of them is hilarious for the rest of us. So play right on and mock the progressive left and their fake news media counterparts in a variety of categories, such as race hustle, <laughs> the wussification of America, earth snobs, <laughs> Islam abomination, <laughs> Hollywood hypocrites, and campus coddling. Campus coddling. <laughs> Fem- Feminism follies and rainbow games, and don't forget, millennial <laughs> entitlement and many others. Right on, created by conservatives for conservatives. Because mocking the left feels so right on. Give the gift of <laughs> all year long by going to rightongame.com. That's rightongame.com. Use promo code MOJO50 for a 10% discount. That's rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. And while you're there, check out the new drinking game option. Warning, microaggressions contained in this box. Millennials and snowflakes will be offended by its contents. Retreating to safe spaces are highly recommended. Rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. (laughs) Rightongame.com. can't handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman, see ya. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, see ya now. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to Mark. Mike Charlie, 473-9er, 8-9er, out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark Smoke on the deck, two rounds, H-E-P-T, cast T-O-T, five for you. Simon Experience. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Amidst all the chaos going on inside the Beltway of Washington, D.C., one thing that it's not getting discussed anymore, it did for a moment, and then it just went away, and that is the Fifth Circuit's decision on Obamacare and where the Department of Justice is. Um, and so what do I do? I, I, I trot on over to Heritage Foundation and a Meridian Paulton has been kind enough to join us on the Denise Simon experience to talk about where we are with this and when um, this thing ends up in the Supreme Court. So with that, Meridian, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. The uh, Fifth Circuit um, ruled that uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional uh did i get that right in whole yeah, and, okay it, you know what um I, I think that the big lesson here is, is not what the what the court says on this uh, ultimately you know, if this gets appealed to the supreme court and uh, whatever whatever the supreme court wants to say about this the ultimate decision is going to have to come back to congress um you know if they say Obamacare is unconstitutional, then we have to do something. Congress has to act. If they say Obamacare is constitutional, then we're still left with the same problems that we've had uh, for years since. Ultimately, the issue comes back to Congress. And so I, th- I think that's really where the conversation needs to go, uh, is what are the issues that Americans are facing? Um, what does Congress need to do to address those? Um, and those issues are that Americans right now don't have a lot of choices. Uh, many of them are trapped in counties where in the individual market, they only have one choice of an insurer, uh, which is no choice, or uh, they're, for, for other reasons, because they're on government health care, don't have a choice. And costs have gone have skyrocketed. They've doubled in just a few years. So it's these low costs, these, they're, they're these high costs, these low choices that we need to address. Um, that's what Congress needs to come back to. All right. Well, here's, I guess, some of the confusion because the Supreme Court already ruled under Justice Roberts that the Affordable Care Act was constitutional. uh, And he what he did, I think, was declare it a tax. So 
we have a different kind of argument here that um that the department of justice is joining in with the fifth circuit on um determining that obamacare is unconstitutional right and and so so the argument uh, that, that they're raising has to do with a, a technicality of the law and a technicality of the uh, of the previous ruling, that being that if you have, um, so, so, so where the previous Supreme Court ruling said that if it's a tax, then that's that's constitutional. You can have a tax. But now, now you have the Justice Department coming back and saying, well, this isn't a tax uh, because now we don't have the individual mandate. There's no actual financial that's penalty. Perfect. Therefore, it's not a tax. Therefore, we're mandating people unconstitutionally. That's okay. the argument. Uh, right. Whether whether or not that stands up in court, though, um, Congress still has to come back to the issue. Sure. Um, now, what's particularly interesting, if you listen to Congress, there's only they only say two things. One is pre-existing conditions and the affordability of prescription drugs. Um, the Democrats are not even speaking to the fact that the deductibles are ridiculous, the premiums are ridiculous, and accessibility to um, health insurance is drying up. Um, and so I would argue that the Republicans have kind of failed to shine a light on that and attach the scarlet letter A back to the Democrats because, you know, um, we we failed at the repeal and replace, and so then they were going to call it Trump Care, but it, that didn't happen. So it's right back to Obamacare, correct? Well, you no, know, that's that's that is where things stand right now, and it's uh, certainly certainly a situation that we want to move past. Um, you're, you're you're exactly right, and what you will allude to, and what I mentioned before, is the fact that all right. So we have in these four just in four years costs have doubled in the individual market. You have people trapped in these places where they can't have a choice of an insurer. Um, and that, that's really what, what Americans are facing. You know, polls show over and over. People want uh, more choices in their health care. They want to see lower costs. Um, at the same time, they do want to have access to their doctor. They do want to make sure that they're getting, um, that their, their pre-existing conditions are covered. So it's important that Congress uh, look for a solution that, that hits all of those check marks that meets what the American people actually want. You know, what the left is pushing as their answer is, is single, payer, single payer, is Medicare for all. So, so they're saying, all right, we're, we're going to just strip your choices entirely. There's going to be one government program for virtually everyone in America. Uh, and those costs for that are actually going to go way up because most people are going to be paying more in taxes than they pay currently in those really high premiums. Uh, that, that's the left solution. So, so it kind of does the opposite of what Americans want rather than uh, decreasing those costs and increasing those choices. It does the exact inverse. Uh, what, what we're supporting and a number of conservatives around the country have uh, begun to rally around is uh, an idea called the Healthcare Choices Proposal. Um, and this really seeks to get at what Americans actually want at those increased choices, at those decreased costs. Uh, one independent study showed that it would reduce costs by nearly a third in oh. the individual market, um, which would be, of course, a significant improvement on the status quo. Um, it would also ensure that everyone has a choice. So, so that, that's that's why we call it the choices proposal, making sure that everyone has a choice of a private insurer, that you're not just trapped in a government plan, uh, that you're not going to be forever stuck in a county where you only have one choice of an insurer. That's the goal of the healthcare choices proposal, and that's where Congress should start looking. And so um, is the choices program on any desks up on the Hill? You know, the um, we have seen a lot of a, a lot of support um, gathering a, a, a nationwide for this. Um, so yes, you know, there, there's there's support from groups uh, and individuals here in Washington, and then also in the states. And I think that's that's an important aspect is remembering that there's there's really two steps to this. Uh, that right right now we have a divided Congress that um, will we're looking probably to 2020. Uh, for the time to actually get this congressional reform through. But in the meantime, there are people who need real help in the states. Um, and the states do have the ability to to ask for permission to for waivers from some of these federal regulations. Uh, and seven states have chosen to pursue that path. And in the states that have, they've seen some really remarkable results. 
Uh, for instance, in Maryland, Maryland sought or, approval to, to get relief from some of these regulations. They saw costs fall by 43% oh, stop, compared really? to what they would have been without those reforms. Uh, so when, when we're talking about uh, just e even these reforms we can make in the meantime while we're waiting for congressional action, that's an important intermediary step that needs to happen. Um, does the CHOICE program, st would it have uh, block grants still in it? Uh, yeah, the, the, so the, the program would, or the, the proposal would use formula grants, uh, the, so the, the states would be the channel, but really what it's looking at is, is empowering individuals. Um, so, so, so you're right, the money, the money gets channeled through the states, but with, with a lot of parameters. So what we're looking at is making sure that uh, pre-existing conditions are covered, that the sick are taken care of, um, so, so state, states have to find a way to, to take care of the sick. States also have to offset uh, the costs for the low income, for those, those who are needy, um, it, 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 while ensuring that everyone has a choice of a private insurer. So even if you're currently in Medicaid, if you currently uh, are stuck in that government program, you should be able to take the value of that Medicaid and apply it towards some kind of private option. Maybe that's private insurance. Maybe that's you, you choose some alternative, working directly with a doctor. Everyone should be able to have that option, and that's the principle behind the Healthcare Choices proposal. There have been a lot of um, cottage-type uh, insurance programs that have been born over the last several years, um, you know, outside of the employer-type um, programs, there's these other membership-type situations. Um, where are we with those? Are they still kind of growing? Are they stagnant? Or um, was, was that any kind of a savior for people that needed um, health care insurance? Yeah, there have been a, a number of those. Um, I think you're alluding to the, the short-term plans uh, in particular that the Trump administration has given some more freedom on. Um, and that's a really important option for people who can't afford these high premiums on the individual market or, or for another reason, uh, need to have uh, some kind of short-term insurance uh, for a year or two, that's an important alternative. And we have seen growth there. And that's another important step that uh, states can take and are taking in many places is making sure that they take advantage of that, making sure that people have the option uh, to escape these uh, regulations, to escape this perverse funding scheme in Obamacare. Uh, and and step into a variety of other options that really empower individuals. Um, Meridian, uh, you know, there's all these kind of regulations that health and human services and CMS and all the rest of them sort of kept throwing in on top of Obamacare. Um, has there been some kind of a team that has looked at all of those regulations that I would argue took the thing to 20,000 pages or whatever it ended up being um, such that, um, you know, we have been removing some of those regulations uh, that have helped. I mean, has that kind of kick-started this whole notion of where, um, you know, uh, health care policy needs to go or health care legislation needs to go? Yeah, we have seen some, some steps in the right direction, certainly not full enough. And, and again, uh, this is ultimately something that Congress has to come back to. There, there are... Uh, statutory problems uh, that, that regulations just, just can't escape. And, and so Congress needs to come back to this issue. But on the regulatory front, uh, we have seen some important steps. So we've seen the uh, short-term plans. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we've seen that expand. We've seen uh, a, a variety of other similar options. Uh, but perhaps most importantly right now is that the Trump administration has opened this door for states uh, to get more flexibility um, in their individual market, in the way that they're managing that. Uh, so so as, as states are asking for permission, which they shouldn't have to do, but uh, as it is right now, they, they ask for a waiver to do that. Um, that's where we're seeing lower costs. That's where we're seeing more choices for people. Um, so it's, it's in those, those rollbacks that we're seeing the hope for, for the near term. And then in the long term, we're looking at Congress needs to come back to this issue that, so that States don't have to have their hands tied so that people mm -hmm. can have the choices that they need so that we can actually empower people to work with their doctors and to get the care that they need. How many people um, are uninsured today that you're aware of? Or do we really have a handle on that number? 
you know that that is an interesting question um, because <laughs> the yeah, as as we're looking at at that number, um, the reality is m- most people have access to some kind of coverage. Now, do we think that that's um, that that's robust enough that that people have uh, the enough options? No, that's why we think that people need to have more options. But when we're just talking about um, insurance broadly, that that's probably a mischaracterization mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, of, of of the possibilities that are out there. What we really need to focus on is getting people access to more more possibilities. Right. Right. I mean, I, my sense is if you get them some kind of access to whatever kind of health insurance provider, whether they uh, buy some kind of um, abbreviated plan uh, just to fit their needs, or they could be a single male at 22 years old living on their own, they don't need, you know, some big fancy Cadillac plan. So, uh, you know, they would, uh, to have them with some uh, some kind of a premium that may be $50 a month with a $1,000 deductible to give them some things that, that there's some comfort level that they would be insured to go to a, a emergency room care. I'd rather have somebody get something and have some monies flowing into the health insurance provider's revenue stream than a nothing. Am I way off on that notion? Well, you know, you're exactly right that uh, people people need to have more options, and that, that that what those options are that they need is going to vary by person. You know, you have someone yeah. who's, who's really sick; they need more comprehensive care, absolutely. But then uh, you have uh, someone who's healthier, who's younger, who uh, maybe just wants to, but they want to have a good relationship with their doctor. Maybe they want to have um, some some alternative coverage. A great example is direct primary care. So. Uh, this is for someone who wants regular access to their doctor, but maybe they they don't have a really severe health need. Right. Uh, so they'll right. want they'll want to pay maybe a hundred dollars a month, um, and then they have access to that doctor uh, for their primary care services. Um, some people might choose to supplement that with catastrophic coverage. There's all kinds of different options that people can take advantage of, but we need to make sure that they have the ability to take advantage of those opportunities. The problem with what the left wants to do, uh, by contrast, is that they want to strip away all of these options. The choices. So they say rather, rather than saying, uh, we're going to increase the choices that people have, we're going to make sure that everyone gets the flexible options, they say there's just no choice. We're just going to make it the, exactly the same across the board, um, which what that, what that means is that you end up with uh, people with uh, really terrible access to care. Uh, when we look at other countries that have single payer, so uh, in particular, if you look at Britain or Canada, what we see time after time is long wait times, long wait lists. In Canada, last year, there were people on wait lists for over a million procedures. Oh, stop it. It's it, it's it's shocking. But it's true that you you have these these incredibly long wait lists in Canada. You have people who are waiting uh, months, if, if not up to right. a year, to get right. their uh, knee surgery or their hip surgery. Uh, th- that'd be shocking to hear of that in America. You, you just you just imagine someone who need, who needs to get a hip surgery, and you tell them you're going to have to wait six months for that. That's just the reality in a single payer country, though. Um, and people don't have the option to go out and pursue a direct primary care option. People don't have the ability to go get some kind of alternative health sharing ministry. They're just stuck in whatever it is that the government gave them. That's where the left wants to go. Uh, and we want to see the exact opposite of that. There was recently, um, in the last, I don't know, a handful of days, a hearing on Medicare for all. Um, okay. But how come there hasn't been a hearing on what necessarily are the existing flaws and the options such that we would bring the, you know, some Canadian healthcare expert in to be part of the witness panel to say, don't go down this path because you've got a million procedure waiting list. You see what I'm saying? I mean, there ought to be some kind of a countermeasure. You're not, probably not going to be able to have it on the on the uh, House side, but you could have it on the on the Senate side, right? Yes, and the interesting thing about that discussion uh, that happened was the fact that 
even even the people who testified there wanting Medicare for all touched on these same issues, though, that they, they want to have greater access to care, that these people want to see lower costs. Here's what they misunderstand, that that's not what you get under single payer. If you want greater <laughs> access to if, if greater access to care, then you're going to, you need to expand that access to care. You need to expand the options that people have, not restrict them. If you want to see if, if you want to see decreased costs, don't go doubling taxes on everyone. Instead, find ways to actually restructure your insurance market so that you actually lower costs. Um, that's the direction that we need to head. That's the response that we need to take. Well, I mean, Medicare for all basically says every man out there, you have to wear a blue three-piece suit. And it only comes in these three sizes. For all you women out there, you only can wear a green dress and it only comes in three sizes. So um, take it or leave it. Other than that, you'll go to, you know, to a thrift store and get black market you know, <laughs> health that, services. That, that is that is that is a great analogy, and that's exactly what happens if if you're in in yes, Canada or you don't uh, go at all. The Canadians, yeah, the, the, they come to America to get care. Uh, yeah. That that's what what Canadians end up doing because they can't get the care that they need in Canada. Well, um, it'll be very fascinating to see where this necessarily goes. I think we're going to be on hold, as you say, for probably. Uh, at least two years. But, you know, in, in that two year span, there's an awful lot of uh, creativity uh, legislatively that can be uh, debated and authored and introduced um, such that, you know, uh, maybe in 2020, um, we can kind of be off on a launch. Uh, I'm, I'm just very anxious, mostly because um, I'm seeing 30 million uninsured or whatever that number is, um, you know, they're yelling and screaming um, and people that are not take, getting care at all. They're not visiting any kind of a doctor because they just don't have those funds. And yet we still have the single payer in play. Uh, we've got the Fifth Circuit Department of Justice item in play. So um, <laughs> it's it's very kind of you to, uh, you know, share some of these um, insights that um, where the that particular industry is going. Um, the other thing that it, I think we have to necessarily worry about are doctors. Um, took my husband to an emergency room last night to for a toe problem, and the, the doctor barely spoke English. So I was like <laughs> a little on the worried side, but. Um, well, Meridian and that's, Paulton that's at Heritage, thank you so much for joining us. It's, uh, we, we certainly appreciate the insight. I may be calling on you again the closer we get to some other kind of trigger point on this. Well, thank you so much for having us. Pleasure talking to you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way, so stay with us. This is Don Newen with Cowboy Logic Radio, and I carry my Sig Sauer 9mm every day. It's like a MasterCard. I never leave home without it. And I'm glad you do, given that you work in Atlanta every day, talking about a rough place to work. Well, Donna, I would say that most of our beloved Cowboy Logic Radio listeners not only own, but carry their weapons, too. It's just the thing to do nowadays. So do I, Don. And we need to share with our listeners a fantastic weapons company, Tar River Arms. Oh, and I should mention, they were founded by United States Marine. Enough said, right? Bad assomatic. TarRiverArms.com. That's T-A-R RiverArms.com. Tar River Arms, America's first virtual gun store, makes it easier and more comfortable than ever to purchase your firearm online. And through 3D interactive experiences, you can even view and inspect that gun you're purchasing. They even have weekly specials that eliminate shipping and broker fees, Donna. Great guns, great prices, and great service. And remember... Tar River Arms is veteran-owned and operated. Don, would you expect anything less from a Marine? No, ma'am. At TarRiverArms.com, you can search by caliber, manufacturer, and firearm types. Revolvers, semi-automatic pistols, including your SIG, Don. Short barrel rifles, long rifles, shotguns, and NFA silencers. They even have very hard-to-find products, such as the H&K MP5. Totally badass. Tar River Arms have some of the coolest high-end tactical weapons made. All at great prices. TarRiverArms.com, U.S. Marine owned and operated. Hoorah! Hoorah.
Hey, gang, did you know that the big cellular companies fund liberal causes and candidates, not Patriot Mobile? You're correct, Donna. Did you know that the big mobile companies have spent over $100 million to elect liberal candidates? They also fund liberal causes, agendas, and organizations such as Planned Parenthood, not Patriot Mobile. Here's how it works. You, our beloved Cowboy Logic Radio listeners, pay your cell phone bill every month. Then Big Mobile takes your money and gives millions to liberal candidates who authorize subsidies to provide free cell service, Obama phones, to do nothings, who vote for more liberals so they can keep getting more free stuff that you pay for, not Patriot Mobile. So here's how you fight back. Switch to Patriot Mobile with unlimited plans starting as low as 20 bucks a month and stop funding The big cellular companies. Feel good about funding the right agendas. Every dollar you spend makes a statement. What message are you sending? And it's easy to switch. You can even keep your same number, and they've got great nationwide coverage that includes Double D Ranch. Visit them online at PatriotMobile.com or call them at 1-800-A-PATRIOT. And for any of the guilt-ridden liberals, that's 1-800-272-8746. Created by conservatives for conservatives. Their name says it all, Patriot Mobile. Do it now, PatriotMobile.com or 1-800-A-PATRIOT. Ladies and gentlemen, what message are you sending? Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. We still have things blowing up in uh, Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway, when it comes to the Mueller report. So um, I brought in my favorite attorney here, uh, author of The Divided Era, and um, commentator du jour on all things Robert Mueller and the uh, Russia investigation, Tom Del Beccaro. Um, thanks, Tom, for joining us. Thanks it so really much for having me on. Quite fireworks <laughs> today, but nothing really beyond that. Well, th- there are two things I kind of really want to speak to, and I-, I I don't think it got imparted nearly enough that um, uh, I think probably uh, Attorney General Barr dropped the ball here a little bit, and that was essentially telling this Senate panel or the Senate committee that there's a presumed innocence that everybody seems to forgetting hello Democrats because they were virtually all posturing their questions. The Democrats are posturing their questions that this president is guilty. And that's what the Mueller report was saying. They, they imparted their own, um, conclusions on the Mueller report when Barr was, you know, he was standing up for the innocence because there was no proven guilt. Did I get that right? I don't know what century you're living in. So you think that in American (laughs) politics today, (laughs) that presumed innocence means anything. And, you know, of course, you're a thousand (laughs) times right. They are treating it, it, it was beyond that. They did two things today. The first thing they did was say, in effect, that uh, he was guilty of crimes. And oh, by the way, the standard for being guilty of crimes is you didn't prove that you weren't guilty of crimes. Because throughout the whole hearing, the Democrats acted like the Mueller report found against Trump. But it never did. They never did say affirmatively collusion. Of course not. There's no evidence. I wrote about that in in Fox, and we need to talk about that. And the second thing they said, here's a bunch of evidence, but we're not concluding anything. But that's not how they did it. But, but of course, that doesn't matter to them, does it? Well, (laughs) I mean, it's really kind of remarkable because the majority of the Democrats that were asking these questions are lawyers themselves. And... uh, uh, it, really? I, I, if you, th- you think they should be entitled to be con- called lawyers still? After well, that well here's a question. I mean, there's, I, a, you know what's I mean, kind what's of remarkable more, is what's more lawyers. Than, 
than Blumenthal saying someone was dishonest. How much more ridiculous can something get? You, you know, this is the reason we have judges. And, uh, you know, I, I've often said this, and judges often get things wrong too. I've often said that you can have a piece of evidence, uh, a tangible piece of evidence, the smoking gun that is sitting on a desk for 25 lawyers to be gathered around this desk, and they're gonna, you're going to get 25 different takeaways. That is what uh, practicing law is really about, correct? Uh, it's not unlike that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. And so yeah. we have Senator Hirono, um, then Senator Booker, and then Senator Kamala Harris, that uh, <laughs> they all obviously had the same memo. But um, Senator Hirono was literally saying, you're a liar to Barr. You need to resign. You stink. And... I would have, I'm kind of surprised that he, he took that, th those insults. The only one that came to his defense was Lindy Graham. But I would have said, do you expect me to answer any of your questions when you preface your time on the clock with those statements to me? Y you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he was at one point saying about to say, when did it descend into, and then he got it cut off. They did slander him and he just looked poker faced at them for to a great degree. Um, I actually, you know, I there's a school of thought that says when someone's doing that to you, that you literally should just do the poker face and don't even dignify it. Um, I'm not sure if I stood up there, I would ag agree with that strategy. You know, uh, you know, Kamala Harris, I mean, <laughs> I, I would have said to him, Kamala, when you were, when you made charging decisions, did you go through all the evidence or did you accept the work of your underling? Right, right, right. I am reminded of an old black and white movie, uh, A Bad Day at Black Rock, where it came out in the movie. There was a, a statement in the movie that said the measure of the man is uh, the, yeah, I think the measure man is guided by uh, his ability to keep his temper. <laughs> and I, I really believe Attorney General Barr did that today. What say you? Yeah, yeah no, no question. Look, he, he, he doesn't, the Democrat, he doesn't take the Democrats as serious human beings and he, and he doesn't expect to be, to be back. He's going to go up there tomorrow perhaps, but after that, he's going to be done with this. You heard him say today, our work here is done. It's done. Mm -hmm. and, and, and on this particular thing. And then, of course, you get the Democrats saying, you know, oh, you know, you should, you have a conflict of interest, which is what? I disagree with you. I don't agree with, with others. That's not a conflict of interest. So, you know, Barr was just, uh, when I uh, prepare my witnesses, I say to them, answer the question in front of you, don't ramble, and you'll be out of there sooner. And that's what Barr's strategy was. Um, you know, normally these witnesses are prepared for what may come. And clearly, uh, I think that Barr was, was prepared for the uh, attacks. Um, in some cases, he just sort of waved them off and dismissed them. He just gave a one word answer and then kind of moved on. Um, and the Republican questions I thought were, some of them were pretty good because they, they rang home to what has been the fire in my belly. And that is the interference of Russia. And what are we doing about it now? And I really wish Barr would have said, Hey, Congress. You are the legislators. If you want significant punishment or sanctions or legislation on violations of <clears throat> foreign interference, then draft it. I would have put it right back in their lap, and I didn't hear him say that. He had, I think he missed that opportunity there, too, would say you. Uh, well, that brings me to Amy Klobuchar, who I think of the three presidential candidates did uh, the best to make her case as to why she should be a vice presidential candidate 
because she had constructive measures that she was offering in that regard, and and he promised to work with her. The others clearly had no intention of wanting someone to work. Yet Cory Booker, who I think fell flat on his face and didn't make, didn't seem to make a point. I mean, he gave Spartacus. his speech, but his point was weak. Um, yeah, Spartacus, his point was weak. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he could have done that. It, it's tough being on the stand and being 100%. Uh, I thought he did a 98-point job. You know, I would have wanted him to say, you know, on this issue, you know, a couple of times to be a little clearer. But that's okay. I mean, I mean keep this in mind. This entire, and I know you know this, this entire day relates to them trying to undermine his credibility going forward because he's going to indict others. And their entire case is confused because at first they say uh, you shouldn't have put out anything or you should have put out what anyone else said. And then you took too long to put it out. And then they complained that he didn't see the evidence, all the evidence. And then they said it took him too long to get it out. Right? You let <laughs> Trump have the floor for two and a half, three weeks. You should have done something earlier. Okay? What? Put out the whole report? No, we had to work on it. So it, it was a bunch of confusing signals for them all to complain what? that the report didn't get out as fast as they wanted because they eventually got the report and it doesn't matter what, what he said. This is all about the indictments to come and they're going to say he was biased all along. The other significant thing that um, I really wish had been um, brought into the discussion was the volume of lawyers uh, in the Department of Justice, uh, at the Deputy Attorney General level, and his staff, um, Barr's staff, uh, and the others that all looked at this. I mean, this wasn't a singular uh, decision by Barr by a long stretch, and he said as much, including the fact that he had conferred with Rosenstein and Mueller many times. Um, so the, the Democrats really cherry picked so much. And then it's like they were all speaking. You take question six, I'll take questions nine and 14. And they just kind of spread the same um, file uh, with, the, with the same attack. Um, are we going to see this if when Barr goes over to the House under the Nadler committee? Yeah, I, I think I wish he would have said earlier in his testimony he, that he would have used the word we, because the reality was the uh, Rod Rosenstein had a greater say in the progress and history of this case yes. by far than Barr did. Yes. And Rosenstein agreed with him on the conclusion of no obstruction. And so uh, I wish you would have said we a lot earlier. Saying, in fact, every answer should have been we, Rosenstein and I, Rosenstein and, and me, whatever it was, to make it clear he didn't do this alone. Which brings us to the most outrageous point, which was Kamala Harris saying that Rosenstein had a conflict because he was a witness. Now, as you well know, I've said it on your show every time we've discussed this, that Rosenstein never should have been the head of this because he wrote the memo to fire Comey. That Correct. made him an inc a very material witness, right? Correct. Suddenly, Kamala Harris decides that that's an actual issue. Where was, where, and I put on Facebook, where was the, why was she so gutless before us to not, to mention this to the American people. And he started to comment on that. He bar saying, you know, the flip-flopping on this issue before she cut him off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, you're going to see nothing but grandstanding tomorrow. They're going to say, and this is exactly why Mueller wrote the 
what Andrew McCarthy calls the roadmap and gave it to the Democrats so that they can do this. And I wrote an op-ed in Fox today about how incredibly, uh, about Mueller's intent. Because Denise, and people can get this at Fox News or politicalvanguard.com, let's be very clear about this. There was never a day that Robert Mueller was apprised of information that would lead him to conclude there was con- collusion. The day he took the job, he hired Strzok, who said there's no there there. James Clapper, uh, the week after he took the job, says he's seen no evidence. And so did Diane Feinstein. Never in between. Two years later, he concludes there was no, there's no evidence of collusion. That meant the, the 700 days in between, there wasn't either. So for him, so basically, he thought his job was in the end to set up a presidency for impeachment. If Mueller had turned down the selection of being um, special. Which he should have done because he interviewed to replace Comey, which made him a material witness. And if he had any integrity at all, he would have said, I shouldn't get anywhere near this. Next question. And I'm angry about that one. (laughs) <laughs> For the sake of argument, he 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 turns down this role. Um, okay. Would there have been a special counsel at all if yeah. he had turned it down? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it depends. Of course, we didn't really know that there was going to be a special counsel. It wasn't like a public thing. Oh, we're looking for one. Apply for the job. What happened was that he he interviewed to be FBI director and then the next day took the job because Rosenstein decided there should, who had a conflict, decided there should be one. If Mueller had said to him, hey, I can't do this. I'm Comey's friend. You wrote the memo. I know everybody in the building. I interviewed for the job. Could Rosenstein that night have said, maybe this isn't the best idea? Possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we we really kind of thought a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, because of the Mueller report and the conclusions, of uh, the summaries, that we can move on. Uh, no, but, I, I, I thought... I thought the, we'd get to Mueller's testimony and that would be the high water mark. And I still think that that's the best they're going to get. We're going to see what Mueller said because Mueller's Mueller's boxed in. If Mueller says in my heart of hearts, I thought he was guilty of obstruction. Then the whole world's going to say, so you were so gutless. You couldn't even say it. And it's arguably right. Right. That makes him look bad. If he if he said, but that fuels the Democrats because they don't care about Robert Mueller at all. That guy could go jump off a cliff tomorrow; they wouldn't care. They said he was great and do the right thing, which they meant. Find Trump guilty, and then, but he didn't. But they don't care. They're done. They're moving on. So. If, if he goes out there and says, in my heart of hearts, I thought he was guilty, um, no one will care on the, so on the, the left after, about him. They'll just say, hold you all along. The one word that was thrown around so many times today was intent. And yet when Comey gets out there and explains uh, the Hillary email server case, he used yeah, the word in, yes. And so was that yet another missed opportunity here, Tom? Could could he have said, Comey couldn't find, Hillary bleached bit a server but said there was no intent. Right. And yet the Democrats find Trump, who didn't do anything like it. Right. Yes, good point. And, and and so there there was no destruction. McGann, you know, obviously at some point he said, "Okay, I'm out of here. I'm not going to do this." 
Um, but I, I also believe that we know Trump's personality is he he kind of has knee jerk reactions and then kind of issues these orders, but he can be talked out of them because he's um, he's reactionary. You know, but Trump remains correct in saying that Mueller, and this is what Barr should say, Mueller should say that he was conflicted. He was conflicted. He was a witness. <laughs> There's no question about it. And I've written about this constantly. And and I wrote about it at Fox, but he never should have taken the job because he was a witness. He was conflicted. So, <laughs> you know, he Trump was right to say he should be gone. He's conflicted. He was conflicted. Well, and and that at least Barr mentioned today that, the, you know, the, there was a stipulation with terminating Mueller because of a conflict. Um, the other track of that was he has the presidential authority to terminate. And uh, so one was a discussion, including Chris Christie, by the way, and the other didn't happen at all, yet he had the authority. So at least he did get that out there, but it was really kind of dismissed. Again, the Democrats are going down the path of the 10 items. Uh, this cat, Donald, is guilty 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 correct what do you what, what do you mean he he was exonerated <laughs> no he wasn't exonerated <laughs> look I, I this this entire episode which is i mean you think about it he put manafort in solitary confinement how many tax sheets do you know wound up in solitary confinement how many swat teams Descend out, have descended on Andrew McCabe. What Mueller did, given there was no evidence ever of collusion, is horrific, reminiscent of his failures in the anthrax, his failure and obsession with the wrong Atlanta bomber, and the, the crime against justice that he did with respect to the Whitey Bulger, the false uh, uh, um, convictions that he wouldn't help overturn up in Boston. I, I have, I don't know why people say Mueller's so great because he routinely failed at his job. Um, well, we have what we have. Um, and we have to kind of go through this, I would imagine, until 2020, uh, un unless um, we can, is, is there a mechanism to say this is over, or will it be over when Barr comes out with his um, eight or ten cases that he's investigating now, all things Hillary, and with the Horowitz and the Huber and the Lindsay um, Graham reports. I think it ends when, I mean, it's going to turn bad on the Democrats and the Russia, Russia, Russia thing is going to, will look bad with independence with them and they're going to give it up on their own. Um, I, I want to believe that, but I just don't believe that they'll, they're going to, they're going to they give it up. Uh, Nancy's not going to give away the house over impeachment or Russia. No, I understand no. that. Uh, no, I understand we're not going to go down the impeachment path because it'll never get out of the Senate. But it it is a headline that I think media and the Democrats have re-grabbed. It went away for, what, two or three weeks, and now they've re-grabbed it. And that's my, that's my concern. Won't last. <sighs> um, only it's so ugly. And remember, that's what this was, entire thing was about. The entire thing about was sliming, uh, um, sliming bar when the future indictments come down. That's what this is all about. If they would go as far as what they did to Kavanaugh, 
um, mobilizing protests and people and witnesses, um, we we have to know that that type of um, activists agenda is uh, uh, still, I would say, being mobilized and concocted. That's what that's where I am with this. Um, we, we we can't. We can't get through this um, to the point where if we're going to talk about a two trillion dollar infrastructure bill or we're going to, you know, work on a, what do we have, affordable prescriptions, you know, any of these other kinds of issues. Um, it's fun to talk about and it's fun to have these meetings with Nancy and Chuck in the White House. But uh, we're we're really dead in the water here for advancing the people's business. Right. Well, I think the, the economy and things have improved and Trump continues to do things. I, one of my basic themes over the last two years is that the, the Republicans have, been, have had the ability to do things because the Democrats don't engage them on issues. They just do personal destruction. So, um, look, I, I would love for there to be further reduction in government deregulation and tax reform. That will never get through the House. To the extent that the ha- not a single bill from the House passes between now and when you and I die <laughs> with Nancy in charge, but I'm okay. Kind of bleak. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, it's all being uh, interfered with, with the whole matter of Venezuela. Um, every president ends up with some kind of, uh, essentially military conflict, and I think that's where we're necessarily headed. Um, okay, Mr. Tom Del Bacaro, uh, author of The Divided Era, contributor over to um, op-eds at uh, the Fox News Channel and all things Robert Mueller, um, one of your uh, compatriots there. So thank you very much for the contribution on this, ladies and gentlemen. It's been fun having you along for the ride, and we'll see you again very soon. Hey, Donna, Cowboy Logic Radio listeners love law enforcement. That's right, Don. And Charity Magnets designs and produces beautiful, high-quality products for law enforcement supporters and enthusiasts. They've got very impressive honor badge car magnets. CharityMagnets.com. They've got license plate honor badges. CharityMagnets.com. They've got cool keychains and license plate frames. CharityMagnets.com. I'm on their website right now, and this is my favorite, the honor badge dog tag. Look at that little doggy with the dog tag. He's so cute. Donna. We're trying to do an ad read, and you're playing around on their website, which happens to be CharityMagnets.com. But he's so cute. Donna. Okay. Hey, this is huge, too. For each sale, a donation will be made to Cops for Kids with Cancer. Cops for Kids with Cancer has given more than $2.5 million in donations. Yes. Become a Blue Honor Foundation member today, like Donna is doing right now. Go to CharityMagnets.com. But he's so cute. All right. Use the promo code MOJO for five bucks off any purchase. I know you all love and support our brave law enforcement professionals and their families. Show your support today by going to CharityMagnets.com and check out that little puppy. He's so cute. Hey, Don, can we go to the pound, get another rescue dog, please? please? No, Donna. No. Five rescue dogs are enough, but I'm going to CharityMagnets.com, and I'm making some purchases right now. Become a Blue Honor Foundation member today. Enter Mojo at checkout and get $5 off. CharityMagnets.com.